Welcome to the Simplicity of the Gospel, brought to you by the Peg Welcome into the Church of Christ Church in Barbados. Tonight I'm speaking on the subject, you are what you think. Some people think that, that you're going to come and tell me that you're a drunkard, that's the only way you can know. The only way you can know some things is because you tell me. Have you ever heard such rubbish? That I could only know certain things because you tell me? Why I tell you so? How you know that about me? You mean you don't know if a man is a drunkard? You don't know if a man black or what he got come to you and tell you I black. Yeah, there's just some things that are that are obvious, some things that speak for themselves. You are we're talking about Jesus, and Jesus is going to address a little bit tonight about thinking. About thinking. We're talking a little bit about thinking. So we're going to use two two verses for our text tonight. The first one we're going to use is Matthew chapter 24, 44, where Jesus is talking about how we think and what we think. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready. You're not ready if you're rude to the pastor. You're not rude if you're disobedient and rebellious. You're not ready. And not to be ready is going to be dangerous. But let me go a little bit further. Ready, don't, don't, let me take this out of context. Therefore be also ready. Not only ready for the coming of the Lord but ready to do business in the church ready to sing that solo ready to take up your bible be ready to take up your bible and preach something be ready to take over the church and run it be ready so the lord said therefore be also ready for in such an hour as you think not see the word thinking there for in such an hour as you think not the son of man is coming so the lord is directing us to the way we think now let's look at another text first part Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7a. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7a. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. I could know a whole lot about you by the way you think. You don't have to tell me. I know if you are retarded or not. I know if you are a fool. The Bible tells me that if you answer a question before you hear it, you are a fool. So I know you're a fool if you do that. You don't have to tell me, well, Pastor, I'm a fool. I know you are because the Bible says that. If you answer a question before you hear it, you are a fool. You're with me? So we're addressing our thought processes tonight. Uh, so the Lord um, is going to tell us a lot about thinking. Let me, let me read some here before, before I go into the depth of telling you that you are what you think. So I listen to you. I hear what you have to say. And I know a lot about you before you revealing it. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So somebody comes in in a, in a, a car with, with, with a fella, and you begin to, what's she doing in there? I wonder where they went. I wonder where they stopped before they get to church. You know what? That's exactly you. That's exactly what you would do. How do I know that? The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh. You know exactly what you would have done. So you don't have to come and tell me. Some people think that you've got to tell you everything for you to know. No, it's not like that. Not like that. Uh, listen to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. He's directing our thinking. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. The Old Testament law is not destroyed. It is fulfilled. All the hard things that you saw in the Old Testament law, they are satisfied by the death of Jesus on the cross. It is not that they don't exist anymore. It's just that we don't have to pay that penalty because somebody paid the penalty for us. Now, how do I know that? The Bible said in the book of Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not. So the Lord that you think that was harsh in the Old Testament, he's the same. So we ought to be thankful for Jesus, but we treat him so shabbily sometimes. If you know what Jesus means to us, huh? when you hear a song like, he paid a debt he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay, I needed someone to take my sins away, that's a big thing. He's done so much for us. And then we treat him with scant respect. So Matthew 5 and verse 17 uh, uh, says, I am not come to destroy the law, are the prophets 
I am come, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. All those things came to, to fulfill is to come to a logical conclusion. They all came to a logical conclusion in Jesus Christ. Jesus, God said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he hasn't forgotten that at all. It, it, when he was being tried in Matthew 26, 53, here he is, he's directing our thinking again. In Matthew 26, 53, he said, uh, thinkest thou not that I cannot know prayer to the Father? I don't have to let you crucify me. I don't, let you to have, I don't have to let you put thorns on my head. I don't have to let you beat my back so badly that it is gold. Jordan, you could even see the bone, because that's how he was beaten. I don't have to let you beat me until you can't even recognize me as a man, because the Bible said that Jesus was so, so severely beaten that his face could not be even recognized as the face of a man. But he said, I don't have to do that. Don't you think that I was, I was not able to ask the Lord to send 12,000 legions of angels and destroy you? Do you know that one angel is so powerful? One angel destroyed in the night 185,000 men. One angel destroyed 185,000 men in one night. It's written in the Bible. So the Lord said all that I went through. So the Lord is trying to get our thinking right. And I've been trying to get the thinking of some people right, but I'm, I'm not failing. I'm not succeeding. But if God can't get it right, I can't. Thank God that he put that in my heart, that things that he can't get people to do, how do I think that I would be able to get them to do? So I think not that I, that I couldn't call 12,000 angels. Um, there's some other scriptures. So the, the, the Lord is telling us, as a man thinketh in his heart, the Bible is telling us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So look at some commands now as we begin to think, as we begin to think about the heart and the mind and things like that. Okay? Ephesians 4 and verse 23. You are what you think. You are what you think. The Lord said in Ephesians 4, 23, that we ought to be renewed in the spirit of your mind because your mind is going to lead you down a path of thinking that could be either fleshy or could be a holy way, a godly way. It, where your mind goes, your thoughts will follow and your actions will follow. So the Lord said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The word spirit with a common S there means attitude. Be, called, be renewed in, in, in the attitude of your mind. We got to do something with our mind because it reveals our thinking. All right? And we hear, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Listen to another text in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We are talking about the mind at this stage because the mind has to do with your thinking. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Christians nowadays don't think about their body. They think we have to be holy, and they think about spirit only. Your body is so important because your body is where the Holy Ghost lives. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It ought to be clean and sanctified and whatever. We'll get to that some other time. But I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice in the Old Testament, they presented dead sacrifices. They bought a sheep, or they bought a, a bull, or they bought a lamb and killed them. That was a dead sacrifice. But the Lord doesn't accept sacrifice, human sacrifices. So he said, present your body as a living sacrifice. How? It ought to be holy. Your body, you know, your body. So we're talking about your thinking still. Your body. Acceptable unto God. You don't just throw anything that you want to throw at God. He doesn't have to accept it. When you present your body unto God, it ought to be holy and it ought to be in a condition that is acceptable unto him. Otherwise, he would reject it. Look, uh, let me read this first and then don't let me forget because these days I forget some things. I'm going to read a scripture in the Old Testament where the priests, the priests offered polluted sacrifices to God. And the Lord said, take it to your governor, say if your governor can accept it. We're going to read that in a minute. But let's finish here first. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We think today that we could throw anything at God and we would accept it. So people come to sing and they're not prepared and they, talk, they say things like, don't listen to the voice, listen to the word. 
You can go down, you can go down town and tell Rasa that if you can sing for him. Don't listen to the voice, but listen to the word. What sort of nonsense that is? Well, if you only want me to listen to the word, then read them. But we think that God can accept anything. We accept we come to church whenever we want, what time we come to church, if we want to come to church. But we believe that God will accept anything because, you know, God is love. A lady called me today and told me she's tired with her church in the New Testament church. All they hear is about love, love, love. They, they, this week they're supposed to do Ananias and Sapphira and they suspect that the pastor is going to buy past that. Because everything got to be sweet. You can't just throw things at God and accept you're going to accept it. If you have to do something for God, you do it with all your heart. You're not doing it for man. We have a text here that I scribbled down here that, that I want you to see. That whatever you do in this church, you're do, you should do heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. None of you, none of you in here, none of you do or does. None of you does because none should be no one. Okay? Does anything for me. You don't come church for me. You don't sing for me. You don't do praise and worship for me. You don't work the mixing board down there for me. You don't bring up the word for me. You do absolutely nothing for me. It has to do with between you and your God. And when you get stubborn and decide you're not doing it, it is to God that you answer. Amen? Yes. The lady told me today, she's tired of her pastor, but she, every, every Monday morning, pastor, I ain't get the message yet. She probably will soon join this church because she loves the message that comes up from this church. I'm disappointed that we're not getting them five days a week. But what can I do? It's not being done for me. It's done for God. God wants me to have the simplicity of the gospel out five day, at least five days a week. And it should be. There's no reason why there shouldn't be. And people calling, asking all the time. There's no reason why there shouldn't be. But let me go back to this for the fourth time. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. I'm not talking about your spirit yet. Your body, a living sacrifice, it must be holy. The word holy means separated from sin unto God. And it must be acceptable to God, which is just your reasonable service. You're not doing anybody any favor. It is just your reasonable service. But look at verse 2 before we go on to the other text. And be not conformed. When you conform something, anybody know these, these, these pl plaster parts things that you make and put up on the wall? You know that you pour something in a mold and it come out looking like the mold? Well, the Lord said, don't let the world, don't let the world do you like that and you come out looking like the world. That's what conform means. Be not conform. Another text says, do not allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. Be not conform to this world, but be ye transformed. It is like changing from an egg to a butterfly. Those of you who did biology at school would know that you went through four stages. The egg, then they got a larva, then you got a pupa, and then you got the butterfly. Talk to me, somebody. Oh, you thought the butterfly used to be worn just as it is. She's surprised. We, we ain't talking about these guys butterflies. Leave me. Leave me. We ain't talking about these butterflies. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have a caterpillar gone. You're right. I apologize. I, left, I, forgot, I forgot the caterpillar. <laughs> Oh, so the again, he's not the right thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you, at which stage are you? You're still done by the egg stage? And if you want to be a beautiful butterfly like we see flying around the place, you got to go through some stages. And nobody should help you. One loving man passed by at one time, and he saw the butterfly at the last stage trying to wiggle its way out of the, the little sack that it was in he said poor thing poor thing it worked so hard he whipped out his razor and he cut the thing and let the butterfly out the butterfly flat 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 and died why because the struggle to get out of that little sack was supposed to strengthen the muscles you understand was supposed to strengthen the muscles so sometimes even in the church we find that we are so we have to tell everybody things that are nice because we want you to come to church. You know, we got to tell you everything that is... No, 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 that's not how it ought to be. You have to struggle sometimes if you're going to get that little cocoon and be the butterfly that you want to be. Be not conformed to this world. The church is too conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is only then that you're going to know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. 
Pastor, what's the will of God for my life? There are lots of things. The will of God is that you present your, your body in sanctification and honor is one. But also the will of God, if you want to know the will of God, and you will never know it unless you do something about your being transformed in your body. Present your body. That body has to do with your mouth. It has to do with your thinking. All parts of the body must go through this transformation. Because without that, we are not going to know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for our lives. Let's look at the third thing. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. We're talking about your mind because your mind has to do with your thought process. Huh? And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So that's why we're talking here at this stage about the mind. Later on, we're going to do some scriptures about thinking. Because I find that people are weird thinking, but I should not be because there are two ways of thinking. There's a worldly way and there's a biblical godly way. The worldly way of thinking is not acceptable by God at all. But the biblical way you got to really strive to get there. And because people are not striving through praying and fasting and really seeking God, because people are not striving, they are living in the flesh. And the Bible tells that if you follow after the flesh, you're going to die. That's the book of Romans. We'll probably get there tonight. Look what the Lord says. If, now you see the word if? You, you don't argue with people who, who, who study the Bible. That word if, can be translated since, S-I-N-C-E. So you can read it like this. Since you are risen with Christ. You're a believer, you're risen with Christ. So since you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above or from above. Seek the word of God. Seek the Bible. Don't have your own way. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Your thoughts should be on things above. All right, but let me go on to verse 2. Let me go on to verse 2. Set your affection, your fond and tender feeling, set your affection on what? On things above. Not on things of this earth. Why? If you are setting your, if, if you are setting your affections on things of this earth, this verse is not fulfilled in you. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When you are dead, you seek things that are above. When, th when you are dead to sin and dead to flesh and dead to the world, because the Bible said that there are three things in the world that are messing us up. The loss of the flesh, the loss of the, the pride of life, and the loss of the third one. Amen? The loss of the flesh, the pride of life, and whatever. Huh? Loss of the eyes. Okay, these are things that are coming at us in such a way these days that if you are not determined, if you're not showing some, what the last text was, show some determination. If you're not showing determination, you are going to be just like, like a dead fish floundering around in the sea, not having any direction. And I see too much of that in the church. These are scriptures that we can obey. For you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Now I only want that, but I remember the other verse says talk about when Christ would appear. So let's go to the next verse and see what you ought to do those three verses. Verse 4. When Christ, whose all life shall appear, that's the rapture, then you will also appear with him in glory. But that is only if you have set your affection on things above. When you set your affection on things above, when you come to church, you gobble up everything. You open up the Bible, you write notes. When you set your mind on things above, you are determined that you're going to pray. If nobody else prays, you are going to pray. When you set your affection on things above, man, you'll be surprised to know the things that you do. That when Christ appeared, brethren, if you miss this, crap or smoke your pipe. When Christ shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Let me give you now another scripture about your mind. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to begin at verse 8. I don't know if you see the same things that I see or if I'm judgmental or what. 
But when I read the scripture and I make a judgment, I make a judgment from the position of what the Bible says. And when you look around at the church today, it ain't doing so well. But look at what the Lord says. Philippians chapter 4. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are true. Everybody say true. Anybody met any lawyers recently? Do you know any? You know any that are compulsive? That can't tell the truth even if you're going to pay a million dollars for every true word that they say? Well, the Lord said that, but you though, whatsoever things are true, the second one, we're talking about your mind, whatsoever things are honest. When you make a report about somebody, is it honest? How do you know it's honest when you didn't search to get the facts? I hear a lot of people scandal in law, pray minister's name. How you know what you're saying is true about the woman? How you know? The Lord warns us of being false witnesses. If you go out the front door and you say, I know the pastor birthday, you know. He born on 20, 25th of December, 1930. You lie. So you're a false witness because you didn't tell the truth. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You, you didn't tell the truth. You, you, you're lying. You're lying. The Lord expects us to do, to do diligence. It's a paper for me. There's some up here. The Lord expects us to do diligence. And before we run off our mouth and start to, start to talk. That's why the Lord forbids us from gossiping, you know. And church folk are so much gossipers. They talk so much. Like I always like to say, without insulting anybody or anything like that, but I like to say, I like to say that they suffer from a verbal diarrhea. Words just flow. Without any backing. So whatsoever things are true, whatsoever, thank you, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, or fear. Somebody who say things to people you know is not fear. Whatsoever things are pure. Well, as Christians, we don't have that propensity to study the things that are pure. The things that are impure, we gobble it up. It's not supposed to be like this. Whatsoever things are lovely. The Bible school fell, young fella tell the teacher that's why he liked to look at the girls. Because they're lovely. And that's what it means, huh? Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. Why are we prone always to give the bad report? Whatsoever things are of good report. You see, we're talking about our thinking, huh? If there be any virtue, you get a report. You study the report. You hear something about somebody. And the Lord said, look. If there be any virtue in what you heard. What is the virtue in talking about big pastors in America who fell? If you did, you're telling the truth. But what virtue is in that? The word virtue means moral excellence. So some of them may be true. But they ain't got no virtue in it. It's like eating bread. You white flour. Ain't got nothing in it. It went through so much a process that what you're eating isn't even worth for the dogs. When you're eating white bread. But you still but you still eat it. Let me make this point again. You hear something about somebody, whether it is true or false, the Bible requires that you see if it is virtuous. What help does it bend in the church if I talk about that? There's some questions you should ask yourself. How am I benefited if I talk about that? How is this going to help me to win a soul if I talk about that? So the Lord tucked in this little piece there where it says, if there be any virtue in it, and if there be anything that is praiseworthy, you might hear something and it's true, but it doesn't bring any praise to anybody. So why you got to talk it? Brethren, I like to teach about these things. I like to teach about things that you don't hear too often from the Bible. Because if you don't do these things, <laughs> when you come on Thursday night, there are some things that I want to talk to you, some real strange thing that Jesus said. Now the Bible don't talk about these days. Let me get a little thing. God said in Luke chapter 16, you can't serve God in money. Today here, go and make as money as you have. Have three or four jobs, you've got to keep bread on the table. The Lord didn't say that. Another thing he says is love and prayer for your enemies. He joking or what? He, he's joking. 
The Lord was saying, turn the other cheek. You get slapped on one side, turn the other side. You hear anything that you hear, you hear any preacher like this today? No, no, no. The Lord said some strange thing. Uh, the Lord said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You, take it, you think denying yourself and taking up your cross is easy? You will hear things like, following Jesus is more important than family. All over the place you hear people saying that your family comes first. When God calls you into ministry as a pastor, pastor, your family comes first. That ain't true. That's not so sure at all. The Bible says, seek ye first what? Come first, you got. Seek ye what? First. And if I look after the king, God's kingdom, he look after my family. But people have this attitude because they know that people want to hear that. So they say, oh, the pastor, you should look after your family first. No, no, that's not biblical. So we can talk about that later. But this one, more important, let me, this is not part of the message, but let me put this in there for you. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62. And let's see if we should look after our family first. I mean, as a pastor, if we should look after our family first or should we go and do what God said? No man can serve two man. This is, what I get. this is the text I gave. What, what text did I give? Luke chapter. Luke chapter 9. Did I give it? Luke chapter 9. 57. Am I right? Is, is the right one? 57 to 62. Okay, let's read then. And it came to pass as they went in the way. A certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever you are going. But first... Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. Listen to this part. Because, because this, the, the, the preachers who are prosperity preachers say that Jesus had enough money. But look what Jesus is saying here. The son of man doesn't even have any place to lay his head. That's what Jesus said. You could believe the prosperity preachers that Jesus had enough money. And the, thing that, the, the proof that they give that Jesus had enough money is they say, well, Judas was the, Jesus was the treasurer. treasurer. Judas was the accountant. What business do you know God? Uh, got an accountant and he got money. You joking? You know how many businesses around the world go bankrupt every day and they got accountants and they ain't got a saint? So the Lord said, I don't have the way to lay my head. But in verse, next verse, Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. Huh? Let the spiritually dead, them be born again, let them, bar, let them bury the physical dead. I'm showing you that family that doesn't come first. But go thou, forget your family that dead, and go preach the gospel. Look at the next verse. And another said, Lord, I'll follow you. But first, let me go home and bid everybody farewell. Tell them I'm going to serve you. This is what the Lord said about family again. Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So this idea of pastor, you got to put your family first. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Let's get back on track. Let's go back on track with, uh, um, with this word about thinking. Because for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let's do a whole lot of verses to show you that God is right. A person is what goes through his mind. A person is what goes through his mind. Something goes through your mind long enough, you're going to follow that's why you got to keep the devil out of your mind. That's why the Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You got to think like Jesus. I didn't realize it was so handsome up there. That's good. All right. A person is what, he, what goes through his mind and what he allows himself to do. All the decisions that he makes, they all go through your mind. Your thoughts have power. A man is what he thinks about. You are what you think about. Your thoughts have power. Thoughts in line with the word of God will protect you, your soul, your spirit, and your body. But negative thoughts will cause you dearly in some areas of your life. Thoughts are important. Negative thoughts. Um, thoughts can come into your mind from all sides. But you can choose what will stay and what will be cast out and you got to do that more so now because the lord says as a man think of in his heart is he you know understand he probably never heard before so you could think whatever you want to think you could think so there are toxic thoughts which like 
I'm talking about stress and worry and fear and anger and unforgiveness. Those are toxic. You don't want them lingering in your mind at all. And th those toxic uh, thoughts can cause a loss of sleep, the loss of the ability to perform your job, physical illness, all those toxic thoughts. God does not want us to think. I didn't finish that verse. That's the whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, the last word say, think on these things. Think on these things. In a spiritual sense, those toxic thoughts connect you to a curse. But when you guard your mind, that's why the Lord said, guard your mind. You know, keep your heart with all diligence, is the way he puts it. Keep your heart with all diligence. Don't let certain thoughts flow through your mind. Because if you dwell on them, it won't be long before they're going to cause a stronghold in your life. Let me show you that. 1 Corinthians 10, 25, I think. 1 Corinthians, maybe you want 10... Second Corinthians, but it's going through my mind. First Corinthians 10, 25. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians then. 10, 25. I'm looking for a scripture which talk about bringing every thought in captivity. Bringing every thought. You have to bring every thought and line it up with the word of God. Otherwise, it causes a stronghold. Your thoughts can lead to a stronghold. Next verse. Okay. But I see in my law, okay, uh, this is what I want. Let's go back to verse 4. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshy, but they are mighty though. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They pull down what? Strongholds. And they do what? Cast down imagination. Notice the word imagination start with image. You can form some images in your mind that can cause a stronghold. Why do you think people are addicted to pornography? But the word of God, the weapons of our warfare will cast down strongholds. Not only that, the weapons of our warfare will cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And you got to work on this today because when people leave university, they come out with so much trash in their mind that they exalt above the knowledge of God. And so now you're warned to make sure that your children are saved before they go to university because they're going, they're going to come up with a knowledge that is exalted above the knowledge of God. It's a, world, it's a worldly view. So cast it on imaginations and every thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring in into captivity the weapons of our warfare are supposed to bring into captivity every thought to make you obey what God says. That's not happening among the intelligentsia these days. I'm so glad I didn't go to that level because I like the word where the Lord says, the Lord said, my strength, my strength is made perfect. Finish it for me. And your weakness. So the Bible said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because his grace is sufficient for me. And my strength is made perfect. His strength, sorry. His strength is made perfect. But you see those people that always know, always have all the answers. They always got to be the brightest part in the bunch. They ought to be always the sharpest knife in the jaw. They got to be heard. They got to win the conversation, even if they make up lies to say. You, you know those sort of person? Those are not good for the kingdom of God. Those are not good for the kingdom of God. Let me prove it to you. First Corinthians chapter 9. I think I'm around 24. And see who the Lord chooses to run his church. See who the Lord chooses to, to, be, to be in the ministry. I am in uh, 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians 9, 24, and it talks about God has chosen, whom God has chosen. Stay there for a little bit at this verse. Stay this verse. This verse proves a point. Jesus said unto Paul, when, not Jesus, but God said unto Paul when he wanted to get the thorn of his flesh out. Remember he had a thorn in the flesh? And he sought the Lord three times and the Lord would not deliver him. And look what the Lord said. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, man. You're going to get rid of those thorns in the flesh. My grace. Huh? You're going to depend on me. Where did the verse disappear? My grace is sufficient. I'm coming back to this verse 26 in a minute. But I want to want. Ah, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, the Lord says. The Lord says, my strength is made perfect. 
in weakness. It's when you are weak that my strength is shown. But when you could do everything and you're, you're, you, you don't have to depend on God, you are in for a failure. My strength is made perfect. So Paul said, when I came to you, stay here for a little while. When I come to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech, but I came with power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. That's what you want. Most gladly, Paul says, since God says your strength is made perfect in my weakness, well, most gladly then, I will rather glory in my infirmities for that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You understand that verse? If when I'm weak, you are strong, let me be weak all the time then. No, not people today. People today want to be strong. But look whom the Lord chose in that verse 26 that we just look at. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. I personally prefer to work with people that you will call dummies. Because they got to depend on God. You get your degree and all kinds of stuff. You come here, you want to take over the place because you now come from university and you, you got all the thoughts. But when you're weak and dumb, we're going to describe five persons here that the Lord says that we would not choose normally to run the church. But God said those are the ones that he wants. Look at here. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh. So the Lord's not looking for your wisdom. Not many mighty. God's not looking for your might. Not many noble. You live in nobility. It doesn't matter, matter to God. Not many of those are called. But look at verse 27. We're talking about your thinking, huh? But God has chosen, listen to this, the foolish things of the world. Why? To confound the wise. Stop trying to be so wise, man. The Bible said, be not wise in your own eyes. Another text said, be not wise in your own conceits. Let us depend upon the Lord. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things. Why we always got to be so strong? Why we always got to be this strong? God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound those that are mighty. But he didn't finish it. Next verse, verse 28. And the base things, really low down. You know the basement? Huh? Low down there? These people couldn't get no churches today. And that's whom the Lord is calling. But they couldn't get no churches. The base things that are, the base things of the world, and things that are despised. Oh, Pastor, you want everybody to love you. You're heading for a fall. Be careful when all men speak well of you, the Bible says. For they did that to the prophets before, but they still executed all of them. So you got to be careful. Base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen. He ain't finished it, you know. And things which are nothing. You are nothing. You know, you are nothing. You, you could teach us Sunday school. You are, yeah, that's the one that God wants. The one that, that knows everything, goes upstairs and all the big words and stupid. Uh, I'm not saying this happened. I'm just giving an example. Huh? People, children don't understand nothing you say at all, at all, at all. You might as well ask the children, what are your name? Because they'll understand, they'll understand that more than, than all the things that you're going to try to bring all this reasoning out of university and from your high school and all that kind of stuff. And it's corrupting the world. It's corrupting the world. Do you know this? Look around Barbados. And if you notice, not I'm saying you shouldn't get a degree, huh? but look at the churches that have pastors with degrees. Look and see what they're doing, if they're doing anything. Look and see. Look and see if the church is growing. Because God is looking for that. If we could go down and play corners and loose and see that church down there with them 12 women that praying. Huh? On a Thursday morning, 12 women gather there. There's so much power in that place when you come on Sunday morning. You can't hold, you could have as many degrees as a thermometer. You can't put them before a demon possessed person and say, come out. So the Lord said, God has chosen things which are despised, things which are nothing. Why? To bring to nothing those that said there is something. Why? In the next verse, verse 29, that no flesh. Man, stop trying to glory in God's presence, man. You're heading for a fall. I'm big. I know everything. Look at me. You know, I don't go on Facebook. And I upset when anybody put my picture on Facebook. I'm up there for sure. I don't go on Facebook. I don't write anything on Facebook. I don't go in the chat. We have a chat around home. I, they have some pastors in Barbados. Everything they do to God, put the picture in the wife on it. For what? Who's you? 
I was watching a, a one up to today. Got another one from, from Maryland that comes down here every now and again. Everything you look here, anyway, God, oh, oh, we want to see you. Humble yourself and do the work of God. Am I making sense or not? Well, if, if, if a booklet comes out, if a booklet comes out, the picture got to be on it. Put a picture of the church, man. I put a picture of the dog or something. But why you got to be up? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, you see, what, when they send their picture up all the time, so what are they thinking in their heart? Look at me. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I know everything that I'm saying so far will be opposed, you know, by, by the intelligence here. But I write. I'm right. Okay? That no flesh should glory in his presence. If you want to work for the Lord, and you should start asking yourself, why after so many years in church, I am not further in the Lord as I am right now? You need to start asking yourself that question and ask if you are fulfilling those words that we had tonight, all these words. Look, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a deacon, if you're standing up at the door, if you're making a contribution to the church, you just come to stand up at the door. You just come to call her name, call a deacon. What's the contribution to the church? Who are you teaching anything to? You could teach us on the school. You could step here and talk for 10 minutes. What, 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 what's the purpose? If you humble yourself, you'll be surprised to know that if the Lord made an ass talk. Anybody know the story of the ass? Uh, pardon me, the donkey? Anybody know the story of the donkey? If the Lord made a donkey talk, you're going to tell me that you can't talk for five minutes on the parable? Jesus, Jesus performed 37 miracles. You can't talk on one of them. What's your purpose? Just to hold a key? What's the purpose? Just to have a name? No, no, no. In the house, you see, we pastors make that mistake. Because we ain't looking for the ones that are base and the ones that are despised. And we ain't looking for them. We're looking for the ones with the big house and the big car. And those are the ones that are no, no benefit at all to the church. Take care, for example. Somebody might get offended, but who cares? Huh? Why well, ain't got nobody to help me? We ain't got deacons and Sunday school teachers and all sorts of people out here. Why you gotta preach every sermon for the last six months? We ain't got nobody to say that can read. If we, the Lord wants to do something, what you're thinking. And if you humble yourself, and that is why I throw open the doors for Tuesday night and Thursday nights. Deacons, come. Deaconesses, come. Prepare something. Add something to the quality of the church. God will help you. Take every thought captive, that last text says, and bring it into, into subjection to God. A few more verses, and I'm not finished, but I'm done. We are talking tonight about the fact that you are what you think. So, you got to watch your thought life. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 21. Don't ever forget my words. That's the text that I want to use. Verse 21. Don't ever forget my words. Keep them always, this verse in the midst of your heart, another translation says, keep them always in mind. Your mind should always be led by the Holy Ghost. For example, if I came to you and I said something to you that agitated you, does the Bible tell you that because I do something wrong, you should do what I'm wrong too? Huh? Does it tell you so? Let me carry it a little bit further. I'm your pastor. If I come to you and I do something wrong to you, or I say something wrong to you, does the Bible tell you that you should disrespect me? Huh? It, it doesn't? I thought so. Let them depart not from your eyes. What? The word of God. Do you find that text where it says, don't ever forget my words, but keep them always in mind? Huh? Why? Because they are the key to life for those who find them. Let's look at verse 22. Let's stay in the King James Version. Why you stay in the word of God? There are life to those that find them and there are health to your flesh. You, health to your flesh means that you'll be healed, you know, by taking the word of God. Huh? Take it three times a day like your doctor tells you. Take prayer three times a day. Faith in God's word. When you get up in the morning, in midday, in the evening, just like you take medication, have faith in God and pray and you'll be surprised to see what happens. They, for there are life to those that find them and health to your flesh. Don't specialize that health to your flesh. The more you get into the word, the more healthy you are. The more the word will heal you. 
And we could go on to verse 23. Be careful what you think, verse 23. That's another translation, but this one says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart, guard your heart. Be careful with the things that you think about. Be careful with the things you think about. In church, I know the church, about other people. Verse 24, give an example. Don't use your mouth to tell lies. Put away from their forward mouth. Don't use your mouth to tell lies. And don't ever say things that are not true. They have a lips there, they have a mouth. And verse 25, keep your eyes focused on what is right. Look, let your eyes look right on. And let your eyelids look straight before you. Because your eye gate is going to let some things into your thought. And your thought, you are what you think. You are what you think. So what we're going to do tonight then, I have a lot more scriptures which tell us about, about our thought processes, but we're going to leave it right there. You have enough tonight and you can pick up this, this text tomorrow or something when it comes out on, on YouTube and we should go back over this. Be careful what you think. What sort of things are um, honest and true and just? If Psalm 1940, we read words like these. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. What you think about be accepted in your sight. Psalm 94, 11, The Lord knows the thoughts of man. So whether you voice them or not, whether you verbalize them or not, Psalm 94, 11 says, The Lord knows the thoughts of man that there are but just a breath. Okay? Psalm 39, verse 23 and verse 24. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. But we tell your thought life tonight, you are what you think. Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. You lean on your own understanding through your thought process. Uh, Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Matthew 6, uh, Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And we could go on and on and on. You are what you think. Jesus said, think not that I have come to call the righteous, but I have come to call sinners to repentance. Jesus said, don't think that I am not able to call so many, so many legions of, of, of angels to protect me. I can. I want to think the right way of the Lord. He said, don't think that I am so poor that I can't call these legions of soldiers. The Lord said, don't think that you're going to have night season to work. The night is coming where no man can work. So let us end this service by saying, think straight, because you're what you think. Bow your heads for a minute and talk to the Lord for two minutes about that. If you do not have a local assembly, feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening, healing and deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., and for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Bless fellowship and enjoy the simplicity of the gospel.